In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I got a text message from my mom this week with three little words followed by an exclamation point. And it wasn't, I love you, or I miss you, or you're my favorite. Everybody already knows that. She texted me, I told you, exclamation point. Three little words that are almost always better off just thinking to ourselves quietly (laughs) rather than saying out loud or putting into words. As a mother of three, I knew exactly how she felt, but still hearing them from her put me on a little edge. Those three little words, I told you, really pack a punch. Now, before you think I'm vilifying my mom, let me explain that we had been talking about the latest episode of our favorite show, Ted Lasso, (laughs) and a prediction that she had made. So her saying, I told you, was completely harmless. But this experience got me thinking about expectations and how often we imagine or think about how we want things to turn out. When we predict it right, We feel joy and excitement and pride like my mom said. But when things turn out to be radically different, we feel disheartened and disappointed and disillusioned. Life is full of these highs and lows and our thoughts, expectations and hopes can play a huge role, not only in how we feel, but how we respond. Some of us might have had the experience of landing our dream job only to find out that half of our hours are spent in meetings that could have been an email. That's not true for me here at St. David's, by the way. Just making a big generalization. (laughs) Some of us got married thinking we'd live happily ever after, and then we had babies, which we expected would sleep through the night, and innately know how to self-soothe but quickly find out that marriage is not a fairy tale. You both have to work at the relationship and babies only innately know how to breathe, pee, poop, and cry. I once heard someone say that the thing that messes us up most in life are the pictures in our heads of how we think it's supposed to be. The disciples we encounter today in Luke's gospel are dealing with just this. In Luke's telling of the resurrection, the women return to the tomb with spices, find the stone rolled away, and two angels in dazzling clothes ask them why they are looking for the living among the dead. The women go and tell the other disciples, but the men think their words are idle tales and do not believe them. First, Peter gets up and runs to the tomb to see if it's true. And then the others go and find it just as the women had said. I'm fairly certain at this point in the narrative, the women said, or at least implied, we told you, but that somehow got edited out of the sacred text. The disciples that we hear about today are so disillusioned by the crucifixion that they cannot bring themselves to go check it out for themselves or hang around just to see what's going to happen. These guys are headed out of town. Luke describes them as looking sad on their journey. They had hoped, meaning they had lost their hope, that Jesus was the Messiah, the one who would redeem Israel. The crucifixion devastated their expectations and their hope. The image that they had in their head of the Messiah did not include him being killed like a common criminal. They had no picture in their heads of Jesus resurrecting on the third day either. The disciples were so set on their expectations of what the Messiah would accomplish that they couldn't believe what was happening in real time, even though Jesus had tried to prepare them for what was going to take place. Even when Jesus shows up on the road with them and beginning with Moses and all the prophets interprets scripture for them, They still don't get it, even though their hearts were burning within them. 
It's not until Jesus takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them that they recognize him and believe that he has risen indeed. We can all probably think of times in our lives that we had expectations that were not met, that led to disillusionment or heartbreak, and other times when maybe we expected the worst and found out the reality wasn't all that bad. Alan de Bottom, an author and founder of the School of Life, once wrote that the difference between hope and despair is the different way of telling stories with the same facts. So interesting to me to think of how the, some of the disciples stayed in Jerusalem and others left for Emmaus, even though they all had the same facts. Some held onto hope while others felt despair. I don't know why some despaired and lost hope while others did not, but I know it happens now very much like it did then. Talk about changes in the church today, and some have hope and others feel despair, even with the same facts. Some of us even waver between the two on any given day or hour. There is no shame in this. Being human means experiencing joy and sorrow, hope and despair, faith and doubt. The good news is that Jesus meets the disciples where they are, whether they're locked away in fear or on the road headed out of town. Jesus seeks them out and restores their hope and faith. As disciples of Jesus, we are not left to deal with disillusionment and disappointment alone. I know when I look back at the times in my life that I have been in a hard season, I can see that God was caring for me and preparing me. Sometimes in transparent ways, but more often in quiet, mysterious ways, I could not understand until I started looking back. I wonder if you too can look back over your life and at times of disillusionment and despair can see how God met you where you were and restored your faith and hope too. For the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it's the interpretation of scripture and ultimately the Eucharist, the breaking of bread, that opens their eyes and restores their hope. There is something mysterious and magical about this pattern that Jesus repeats of taking something ordinary like bread, blessing it, breaking it, and sharing it that changes everything. The same pattern is true in our lives too. When we experience brokenness, we can trust that God is with us and will take, bless, and use it for good. This is not to say that God intentionally breaks us or inflicts pain and suffering on us, but that God will take our lives and use all the highs and lows for good. We can expect in our faith journeys that things will not always go the way we expect or hope, and we may find ourselves in seasons of despair and disappointment. Some of our prayers will be answered, and others will not be answered in the way that we want. That's why we always pray for God's will to be done and not our own. The more open and committed we are to God's will, the more likely we are to avoid the pain and confusion that comes from unmet expectations. The facts, I think, are clear. God is good. God is love. God is always with us. God is merciful and gracious and slow to anger. God is faithful and willing to seek us out, even when we doubt or lose our faith and head out of town. We can rejoice in knowing that even when we get off track and end up disheartened and disillusioned, even for no good reason, Jesus will show up and, and will not, I'm sorry, let me say that again. Jesus will not show up and proclaim those three little words, I told you. Instead, we are continually invited to encounter the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread and in the interpretation of scripture and in a million other ways every single day. 
My prayer for us today is that God will help us keep our hope and expectations rooted in the facts about who we know God to be. And that when we find ourselves stuck in despair and disillusionment, that we will stay open to experiencing how God is revealed to us in the sacraments and in the scriptures to restore our faith and bring us back to hope. Amen.